Hello Penguin Orts, I'm the Bearded Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance. Today we're starting the episode by unlocking some new technologies. First grabbing ourselves a large habitation ring, then an upgrade to our interstellar science labs, and finally a new nuclear engine, a closed cycle gas core engine. And then we have to travel back and uh, unlock ourselves a thermal ramjet and then a fusion reactor reasons for which I will discuss later, although we don't actually end up using it. And we just finish off by getting ourselves an upgrade to said thermal ramjet. So, today we are launching the various pieces of our upcoming jewel mission, or Reaper, as the planet is now called. Now, it's a three-year journey to get out there, so we're not sparing any expense. This is going to be a massive mission with multiple landers. We're going to land on every single moon. We're not going to land on Reaper itself, because if you Recall, after Kerbin reveals that all along Jewel has actually been a very large rocky planet, just with a very thick atmosphere. Uh, we might land on that at a later date, maybe when we have warp technology. But yeah, it's nine and a half kilometers per second of delta V necessary in order to land, and then another nine and a half kilometers per second uh, in order to get back up into orbit. And you can't even use like a space plane using you know, fusion or antimatter reactors because you slam into that atmosphere without three 3.75 meter heat shields and yeah, you're done. You experience about 20 Gs, I think, even just scraping the upper part of the atmosphere. So uh, yeah, maybe that's a, uh, that's a dilemma for a later time. But right now we are just launching the core command and habitation module of our mighty mothership, which we are christening the Morning Star. So I decided to name the various parts of this mission after characters in Red Rising because I've started reading the fourth uh, novel in that series. It's a very, very good science fiction series. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, it's a little bit sad, actually, because there was an original trilogy, and then it's sort of it's all brought to a close. And this fourth one picks up uh, ten years later. And you know, naturally, in order to tell some stories, you got to do this. But you know, all the things they fight for in the, <laughs> the first trilogy, everything's in ten years. Everything's just gone to crap. It's <laughs> it's really quite depressing, unless you're. Uh, yeah, unless <laughs> you've got a pretty pretty strong uh, resistance to tears, I think uh, you might want to give it a miss. One of my mates who also reads it said to me, he was like, yeah, um, yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> let's, let's just be clear, the fourth one just destroys everything that you think they achieved during the first three. But, you know, I guess that's what you need in order to uh, kick off a new trilogy. But anyway, I didn't actually quite realise quite how appropriate this uh, naming theme was until I realised that we're going to the planet Reaper and then the main character of Red Rising is actually called the Reaper. So it's uh, I didn't realise quite how appropriate it was. I, I decided on the Red Rising theme and then realised that and I was like, yeah, maybe I'll pretend that that was intentional all along, but no, uh, <laughs> it wasn't. But, you know, what can you do? So you see here, just uh, as usual, using our Albatross 15 launch system. This is actually uh, 15B, but later in the episode we actually get the reusability expansion mod, which adds a, a bunch of grid fit and uh, SpaceX style landing legs and all that good stuff so uh, our reusability becomes a fair bit easier. Uh, this time we didn't quite land uh, as close to the Space Center as I'd have liked but we still get about a 95% recovery bonus. And you see here just reusing the, uh, the good old second stage as well. Uh, I realized we had a bit of a rough re-entry here so in future I add on a much larger fuel tank uh, for our boost back slash uh, re-entry burn so to make sure we can slow down in time uh, and reduce a bit more of our velocity just to make sure that we don't lose any of those engines on re-entry because uh, with some of the lighter payloads when we're going a little a little faster some of those re-entries can get a little bit rough but we land it just fine and we get out our engineer our load engineer on this mission to expand the habitation module it requires 46,000 material which you see there, we've actually put at the top of the uh, third stage, and it needs to be inflated from EVA. But that is going to uh, provide our Kerbals with a lot of habitation time. Um, so yeah, we don't have to worry too much about uh, about them getting homesick while we're out there. But you might have noticed there is a large module actually at the front of Morningstar. 
which is a cryonic freezing chamber for the 10 Kerbals which are going to be on this mission. And we're going to use that to uh, freeze all our non-essential personnel uh, for the journey there. Because it's a three-year journey there, three-year journey back. Uh, yeah, it just saved us not so much the habitation time, uh, but it saves us a lot of weight when it comes to supplies. We've tried to save a lot of weight by using agroponics uh, and the like, so we're growing a lot of our food in situ. That's what those uh, four different uh, agroponics modules there are for. But uh, even then, we don't quite have enough supplies. So it saves us something like 50 tons worth of supplies, which is uh, it's certainly worth uh, having. So you see here, we're actually transferring over um, the stored experiments that we had left over from our Reclaimer and Odyssey missions. So down to Demise and the Wasteland. So we left a bunch of those spare reports just on Thea Station. And since we've got three uh, upgraded science labs here, I thought we might as well give our six scientists something to do. Yes, six scientists are sending on this mission with three separate science labs. Uh, yeah, this mission, as I said, we're sparing no expense. This is going to be the mission to unlock us warp technology. So I want to be able to research the data that we're getting out at Reaper as fast, pretty much as fast as we're getting it. Uh, so for that, I wanted to have three separate science labs each with level 4 and level 3 scientists. So even now, just in low solitude orbit and researching the data that we got from the missions to Demise and uh, the Wasteland, each of those is generating 20 science a day. So we're getting 60 science a day already. This is before we've even headed out to the Reaper um, system. So yeah, I think we're going to be generating quite a fair bit of science when we're out there. So, this here is the Mustang Cargo SSTO. I haven't really dabbled in SSTOs up to this point, um, but since we're going to be landing on two bodies, so two moons of the Reaper uh, system, which actually have oxygen atmospheres, that's Valiant and Arados, so Val and Lathe, I thought we might as well have an SSTO. And also because both of those bodies have oceans, and I thought, what would be pretty freaking awesome is if we built some kind of submarine. So I didn't install the entire maritime pack, I just installed about five parts. Some buoyancy parts and a uh, propeller from the maritime pack. And I've created us a little rover submarine hybrid and it's going to be really cool. I mean there's no real scientific reason to uh, explore in the oceans. It's just going to be cool to look at the uh, the ocean bed of those worlds. Again, we're not going to get any more science from doing it, but I think you actually get uh, depth records. So we'll get some world firsts from exceeding certain depths on those worlds, which I only found out when testing the submarine. I had a little dive in uh, Solitude's Lonely Ocean and started getting world firsts for depth records. I did not realize that was a thing uh, until I started doing that, but yeah, it is. I'm sure many of you who, I say many of you, well, there's a few of you, I'm sure, who uh, use SSTOs regularly are probably crying right now at my flight profile. I, I don't use SSTOs regularly, and in this series, this is our first one because it's a lot harder to design SSTOs for Solitude. It's got a much larger radius than um, Kerbin does. So, and it also has um, a much different uh, atmosphere profile. So, since the horizontal velocity is the most important part, really, of, uh, of an SSTO, the planet's radius is the most important bit. Getting up to altitude really doesn't take that long. It's it's getting up as much velocity as you can inside the atmosphere. And of course, there's a limit to how fast we can go in atmosphere. So when you get up to kilom a kilometer or a half per second or so um, around Kerbin, you're pretty much almost at orbital velocity. Whereas with Solitude, since the radius is so much larger, um, we have to spend a lot longer in the closed cycle mode using our internal oxidizer. So building cargo SSTOs for Solitude is a little bit of a pain in the ass. Now the reason why we unlocked the thermal ramjet and the fusion engine is because I thought, you know what? It's gonna, we're going to try and spend as long as we can in the atmosphere. Why don't we use a fusion reactor? So we just pass the incoming atmosphere through the reactor and out the back through thermal ramjet. That was a wonderful idea. And I almost got it to work. I was It was so close to working. But unfortunately, our fusion technology just isn't quite good enough yet. So we couldn't get the thrust to weight ratio um, that we needed. We could get up to pretty high speeds. And of course, the um, closed cycle mode of the 
of the um, thermal ramjets just feeding the fuel through the reactor is much more efficient than the closed cycle mode of these Sabre engines, which need liquid fuel and oxidizer. But you just can't get the thrust to weight ratio from it. These Sabre engines have got at least five times the thrust, um, and they're a lot lighter as well than a whole a double fusion reactor setup, um, even using the lighter fusion reactor that's pretty much optimized for SSTOs. If it wasn't a cargo SSTO, it would have worked. We kept getting within like 50 meters per second of orbital velocity, and yeah, it would have worked around Valiant and Lathe, uh, I say Lathe, Arados. But uh, yeah, in the end, I just thought it's lighter, this setup, so it's going to be easier to transport it out there, and it's a better thrust to weight ratio. At the moment, we just don't quite have the technology to make a fusion powered cargo SSTO a reality. We could very well get uh, just a crew SSTO, but yeah, trans transporting this uh, 15 ton rover is a bit of a pain. Yeah, it's quite a heavy rover. It's not just a light rover with the Kerbals and external command seats, it's fully enclosed um, with a great big propeller and buoyancy system and stuff. Yeah, it's quite heavy. It weighs between 10 and 15 tons um, so being able to transport that down to the surface um, of Arados and actually back up off of the surface of Arados because we need to land explore the oceans then put it back in the cargo bay transport it back up into orbit and then take it to Valiant because I want to explore the oceans of both of those worlds um, so it was quite important um, and as I said just with the thrust to weight ratio it ends up um, being more efficient to use Sabre engines at this time and hey, Sabre engines look pretty awesome anyway, so uh, yeah, pretty cool. That's sort of the end goal of, of the course I'm doing at the moment, actually, is to go work for Reaction Engines Limited and go work on the real-life Sabre engine. Uh, they've made a lot of progress with it recently. It was in the news. They actually, they're getting close to doing um, firings of it, which is pretty awesome. Pretty massive step towards making Skylon, you know, the world's first actual single stage to orbit space plane a reality. But anyway, we're just rendezvousing the uh, Mustang SSTO here with Morning Star. So Mustang is a character in Red Rising, and I thought, yeah, it's the most appropriate since this is a very elegant looking space plane. This took quite a long time to design uh, and build, which is why this episode has taken a while, because designing all the different interlocking components of this mission and testing them to high heaven <laughs> took a fair bit of time, because of course we can't afford for any failures when we're out there. It's a three year trip to get there, so if we get out there and something doesn't work, we're absolutely stuffed, so I had to absolutely rigorously test everything uh, in order to make sure it would all work and make sure we have enough delta v to get out there we're going to be using uh, nuclear propulsion you saw we unlocked those big nuclear engines earlier uh, in order to actually get out there but we are going to have to refuel while we're there and i know some of you are thinking ah beardy you you know how how dare you refuel in situ you know you've got all these youtube videos online of you know no refueling blah blah blah, blah. we're running a career mode okay we're <laughs> We're here to save money and get science on like a warp drive. It makes a lot of sense to refuel while we're out there. So we're going to be mining uh, Valm, which is Pol, uh, with its low gravity. And we're going to be, yeah, we're going to be mining uh, while we're out there in order to refuel the spacecraft. We could probably do it without refueling, but I just, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I think we have enough budget, mar uh, enough Delta V budget to actually do it, even with the spacecraft that I'm designing here, but I just, I didn't want to risk it. Again, if we get out there and we run out of fuel, it's not like Demise, we can send a mission, we, it'll be there in six months. Three year journey! We can't afford for anything to go wrong. So you see there, just using some excess fuel from that third stage, just to refuel um, the Mustang SSTO partially, it saves us launching extra fuel into orbit, so we might as well use it. Then we just align ourselves along our prograde vector, and we fire fire it back into the atmosphere, keeping the space junk down, although space junk is a little bit of a problem <laughs> in our install. I've been a bit irresponsible, uh, I'm not going to lie, and yeah, a few pieces of debris came within five kilometers of this spacecraft while I was constructing it, a few pieces of high energy debris just left over spent third stages from our early moon missions and stuff. Yeah, I have not been very responsible in this series, we're not going to get hit by anything I'm sure, but yeah, there is a lot more space debris around solitude that I'm entirely comfortable with, but uh, maybe we'll deal with that at a later date. <laughs> anyway, so now we are launching another lander. So we have our Mustang SSTO to land on Arados and to land us on Valiant, but we need a heavy lander to land us on Tilos, which has actually got higher gravity than Tyler used to have because Bop smashed into it and added a bit of extra mass. So it's got 0.85 Gs of surface gravity and it's gonna require a fair bit of Delta V, pretty much the same map Delta V as it took to land on Demise. So what I just did is essentially redesigned the monument lander that we sent to Demise. This is called the Ragnar, which I think is a, 
quite appropriate. If you've read Red Rising, Ragnar is a big hulking character, um, and he's the sort of the spirit of the uh, the Red Uprising. So I actually, I'm just thinking about it now. Red Rising is is even more appropriate because. We're starting on a red planet. We <laughs> Our home planet is the red planet, Solitude. Red rising. We're yeah, oh, it's, it's like poetry. It rhymes. <laughs> but as you can see here, uh, we're launching it up into orbit. Um, and it's it's quite heavily redesigned from the Monument Lander. It still has the rover because we're only going to be landing once on Tillo. So I want to try and land in between a few biomes and explore as many as we can, make the most of our single landing. But we've replaced the engines because now we've installed reusability expansion. As you can see, we've got landing legs, actual big ones, which means we can stick large, heavy landing legs on, uh, which means we can fit some larger engines on than those LV-909s. The big problem with our Monument Lander is it had a really low thrust to weight ratio. So our flight profile had to be absolutely perfect and by the time we landed we were running on fumes it took me best part of two hours to do that landing this time yeah no we're actually got a slightly tighter um, delta v budget because it does require a little bit less delta v to land on tillos but we have much more powerful engines so we've got uh, at least a thrust to weight ratio of 1.8 when we start and then by the time we land it's about 2.5 whereas with the uh, demise lander it was 0.6 when we started burning so we needed to start burning at like 100 kilometers uh, it was, yeah, it was a bit crazy. <laughs> it wasn't a particularly good design, uh, I'm not going to lie. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty glad that we actually have some large landing gear so we can uh, strap on some much larger and only slightly less efficient engines. But as you'll see, now we have KSP reusability expansion. So we've stuck a bunch of large landing legs on our boosters, which means we won't have to be landing them on their delicate engines anymore, which is a little bit unrealistic. It looked a little weird. Uh, and as you see here, this time we're being a bit more accurate as well. Using the grid fins as well means that we can actually uh, hone down our uh, trajectory. So this time we get it really close. My aim is to actually land one of these stages on the launch pad. That would be pretty awesome but this time we managed the next best thing we managed to land it on the runway this is without using like Kerbal operating system or anything this was our, my first attempt uh, so I was pretty damn proud of that and you see here we switch to the second stage unfortunately with redesigning the launch vehicle this is now the Albatross 15C I forgot to disable fuel flow from the bottom fuel tank so we can't do a re-entry burn and that means we are entering the atmosphere way too fast and unfortunately we lose the second stage so you know testing a new launch vehicle it's inevitable we're going to have certain failures but uh, that, that costs us a few hundred thousand funds but thankfully we can actually afford that now uh, we have artemis supplying us with exotic minerals and rare metals so uh, it's not too much of a problem you can see here we're just getting us our uh, intercept with morning star so once we've rendezvoused the Ragnar with Morningstar. All we're then going to need is the fuel module to uh, power, well, fuel our, uh, <laughs> our massive propulsion module. And then, of course, we need the propulsion module itself. Uh, each of these modules are, are very large, 200 tons each. So uh, that's what that's the maximum lifting capability of the um, of the Albatross. Um, although I don't think, no, we are using the Albatross for this one. It's one of the later launches. We don't actually use the Albatross. We go back to using one of our older launch vehicles. Um, you can see here, we have a bunch of fuel still left in the stage. So what I decided to do is pretty much uh, a similar thing to what we did um, with the uh, third stage of the first module. Although this time we did actually put in a bit of extra fuel and a lot of extra monopropellant as well because we uh, used up a bunch of our monopropellant in rendezvousing. So this has got uh, a bunch of extra fuel in its stage since the lander itself is only about 100 tons and it's a 200 ton launch vehicle. Uh, so we have more than enough uh, liquid fuel and oxidizer to fully refuel the Mustang SSTO. So we're not going to have to do a whole separate launch. You'll see me combining a bunch of things into single launches here since the Albatross is such a, uh, a powerful launch vehicle. And then all we have to do is realign the Ragnar. And now it's pretty much balanced. The um, Mustang is about 40 tons heavier than the Ragnar, but uh, with heavily gimbling engines, which we will have, and a lot of monopropellant, we should be fine. So in the next episode, we are going to launch up the propulsion module, the fuel module, and then the Val mining lander. And of course, some few, uh, a few atmospheric probes to uh, go land on Reaper as well. You see here, we're just uh, loading up the science bays with a number of uh, experiments. And uh, they can do a pretty cool thing, which is analyzing their environment and generating data from that. These uh, interstellar science labs are a big improvement on the old 
stock ones. But anyway, thank you for watching everyone. I've been the Beardy Penguin, and I'll see you all next time.